Hello and welcome to your treatment part three notes. And these notes will be looking at the, um, the opposite or the, the addition to therapy, which is biomedical. In the first two notes, we looked at psychotherapies, meaning that uh, you're just talking about things that don't involve physical alteration. So biomedical therapies are, are going to be something that's physically altering, whether it's your brain chemistry or physically altering your body. Uh, these are usually for more serious disorders, um, with the exception of things like uh, anxiety, generalized anxiety, and depression, which are pretty common to use at medications for. Um, but usually we're talking about more serious disorders like the schizophrenia, the things that it's, it's difficult to function in life without type, some type of medication. And you need to know that even though we talk about these things separately, that usually they are used in conjunction with the psychotherapy. So that if you're taking an antidepressant, you are also usually in therapy. The two together have been shown to have the highest rates of um, uh, coming out of the disorder or feeling, you know, going back to normal. Uh, your anxiety, your depression, anything uh, with eating disorders involves, usually there's a combination of the um, medication and a therapy. Okay, so, and these notes are really just going to talk about our biomed therapies. Uh, your biomedical therapies, that's not going down, there we go, first page. Uh, again, it's going to be anything where there's some type of physical alteration of the body. Now that can be in one of two ways. So it can either be a chemistry alteration or a circuitry alteration. So let's talk about the chemistry first. When we're looking at chemistry, we're looking at neurotransmitters. So you've memorized these neurotransmitters that are involved in things like depression and anxiety and schizophrenia and Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. Those are all considered those chemicals in your body. A neurotransmitter is ultimately just a chemical in your body and you can put synthetic chemicals into your body. So any type or any time we're altering our our chemistry of our brain, we're going to call those um, a biomed therapy with drugs. Okay, so drugs alter chemistry for biomed. Now circuitry can be altered in um, three different ways that you need to know about. So electroconvulsive therapy, which is electroshock, uh, where your mind or your whole body uh, mind or whole body is given some type of electrical impulses uh, that would alter the circuitry of how your brain is it might already be producing enough serotonin but they need to somehow um, alter the circuitry so that it's that it's moving around uh, this is also true of magnetic impulses there's not the you know like shaking that's involved with the electroshock therapy but magnetic impulses have also been used in parts of the brain to try and st sim stimulate uh, production of um, neurotransmitters or to reduce the reduction of and then psychotherapies are going to be things like lobotomies we'll talk about those later but that's where physically you're altering your brain like taking portions out and we'll talk about how much those are used these days and how much they used to be used, the history of those. Now you need to know that a psychiatrist is different from a psychologist or a therapist and that a psychiatrist is someone who's able to prescribe these medications or prescribe the things that need to be done in order to help the patient. Okay, so let's start talking about, we're gonna start kind of the top and work our way down with the chemistry. Let's talk about psychopharmacology. And the psychopharmacology, so anytime we have a word that's ology is going to be the study of and it's really the study of the drugs effects on the mind so I took three psychopharmacology classes in college the one was psychopharmacology of uh, drugs of abuse so just looking at like alcohol and nicotine and cocaine and uh, acid and those types of drugs of abuse but also psychopharmacology can just look at everyday drugs we take like aspirin and uh, things for antidepressants, SS, uh, serotonin up, reuptake inhibitors, things like that. So psychopharmacology, study of drugs effects on the mind. And there's a couple things that we need to consider when we're looking at drug therapy that kind of go back to the beginning of the year and we looked at studies and how we test on whether or not something is um, actually the drug working or the placebo effect. Uh, so some factors that you need to consider with drug therapies. First of all, when we're looking at drug, like whether or not a drug is going to be useful or it's actually doing what it's supposed to, we have to compare the rate at which the person starts feeling normal to the rate at which an, uh, someone who's untreated would go back to normal. 
Okay, so a lot of drugs that you take take about a month to actually build up in your system where you feel the effects. So for instance, if you take an antidepressant, you don't tend to feel those effects for about three weeks. So it takes you that long to kind of build up enough ser um, serotonin in your body to start feeling back to normal. Well, what would someone who think uh, who is not so a normal recovery rate and untreated patients how long would it take them to go back to normal so you have to compare those rates it might take them the same amount of time it might take them less it might take them more and then we always have to keep in effect the placebo um, I'm sorry keep in mind the placebo effect uh, when we're looking at new drugs so is it because I'm actually taking something that's physically altering my body and I'm feeling better or is it just that I believe I'm taking something that's going to make me feel better or a combination of both. And the double blind procedure, remember, is that when the person who's taking the medication doesn't know if they're taking it and the person who's giving it doesn't know who's actually receiving the placebo and who's receiving the actual drug. So double blind is when both parts are unaware of who is receiving the drug. Now, drug therapy has been shown to be very effective, especially when we're looking at the amount of patients that are in mental hospitals. So here's a chart, and on the left-hand side, we're looking at the number of patients in mental hospitals in the thousands, so from 1900 to present. So again, we're looking at in the thousands. So for instance, in the 1900s, there's over 100,000 people in the US in a state hospital. This rose steadily until the 1955. You should know that before 1970, being admitted to a mental hospital was pretty, anyone could have you committed uh, for things like getting pregnant out of wedlock. If your wife wanted to divorce you, you could put her in a mental hospi hospital. So there's been some other things that have changed not just drug, uh, drug therapy with mental hospitals. But in the mid-1950s, uh, there was the introduction of antipsychotic drugs. And what happened after that is that the rate at which people were put into the mental hospitals, and thus their populations, dropped drastically. Okay, so I have this introduction in the 1950s. Right after 1960, I get a rapid decline in uh, the amount of people that are in mental hospitals until the 2000s where it's gone below where it was in the beginning. So the drugs, antipsychotic drugs have done a lot for people with serious psychological disorders to the point where they're not having to go to a mental hospital. They're able to stay at home and function in real life or have family members take care of them. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about antipsychotic drugs. Antipsychotic drugs, you will need to know these big names. Um, I know that's a lot to memorize. Hold on just a second. Sorry, I don't know, I just left off. So anyways, antipsychotic drugs really came around because of their side effects. So they were used in the first place to treat something else, but they had these side effects, like a calming side effect, uh, that they thought might be useful for psychosis, so patients who were considered psychotic. psychotic. Uh, so one like uh, thorazine, this is really a calming, or the chlor promazine, which is also, which is common name as thorazine, and he actually he mentioned this in the movie The uh, A Beautiful Mind. It's a calming drug. It's a sedative. So they found that with patients like schizophrenia, it actually calms them down. They used it for other things, but they ended up using it in ultimately to treat uh, patients with schizophrenia. Uh, what they found, though, is because it has this effect on dopamine. So we're really going to talk about two different neurotransmitters with our drugs. So our dopamine which remember we increase those amounts um, with schizophrenia and in Parkinson's there's a lack of dopamine. So lacking dope, go to the park too much, makes you crazy, right? So that's our dopamine kind of um, mnemonic device. Uh, so we're messing with the amounts of dopamine in the system. In it to excess, remember it makes us crazy, the um, schizophrenia and not enough, it goes to Parkinson's. And thorazine does something like that too. It, it calms down the dopamine production and it calms down thus the symptoms of it. So some side effects though of antipsychotic drugs uh, can be things like one of them that your book mentions, I don't know why above the all, is tardive dyskinesia. So you can kind of break this word down to think, figure out what it means. Tardive means to slow down um, and dis, the kinesia means to move, dis means uh, kind of disjointed or whatever. Uh, this is after a long time of using these drugs. Sometimes people get nervous, like facial twitches, I'll go like this for you, um, random smiles or like 
sticking out of the tongues or twitches with their eyes. So this is called tardive dyskinesia. They're long-term, after using the job for a long time, involuntary face movements. Uh, and then you, we're going to look at types of drugs that are considered an, atypical antipsychotics. So usually we just go one way or the other, right? We want to amp up the dopamine or decrease the dopamine or amp up the serotonin or decrease the serotonin. Atypical antipsychotics like um, close the rail actually do both. They have positive and negative symptoms. They may amp up one thing and then decrease another. So you need to know that, so positive, remember, is adding something to the system. Negative is taking it away. Atypical, meaning not typical, do both, okay? Anti-anxiety drugs, something, ones that you need to know. These are ones that are going to fight anxiety. Xanax, Declosarine, I don't know, Ativan, pretty uh, common uh, things that you've probably heard about. They even have infomercials or commercials for some of these things. And uh, anti-anxiety drugs, just like antidepressant drugs, take a long time for it to build up in your body. So it's not a, um, a an immediate effect as far as the, the Xanax and the Ativan. Uh, some of them act faster than others. Uh, for instance, the Ativan is a little bit faster acting for people who have anxiety attacks, it acts faster. Xanax is something that people might take on a daily basis to kind of keep time. Now something that we need to talk about with any type of anti-anxiety uh, or antidepressant drug is the uh, physiological dependence. So not uh, the body's, or I'm sorry, the mind's dependence, but the body's dependence on it. So if you're taking this for for too long or for excessive periods of time, your body might build up a dependence on it, meaning that as you move off of it, your body might be like go through withdrawals and get anxious just knowing that you're not on it. And so physiological dependence is when your body builds a dependence on it, not necessarily just your mind. Okay, so those are our anti-anxiety drugs. Our antidepressant drugs, that you'll definitely need to know, Prozac and Paxil, I don't think you ever had to know the flozetine um, because it's called Prozac. So Prozac and Paxil are antidepressant drugs, so fighting uh, depression. And these ones are used both with depression and then mood disorders that we learned about in our abnormal psych. And both of these are uh, called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And if you look at this diagram here, what it's showing you, so we say that again, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It's inhibiting or blocking the reuptake of serotonin selectively. So read it backwards, it makes more sense. So that, that would be these little uh, orange things in your diagram here, and they're bigger in the next one. But if all these little green things are my serotonin, remember our bodies or our, our um, terminal buttons naturally want to take them back up into the cell. Well, if that's being taken up too much, and serotonin is what's is linked to our moods, we want to keep them in the synaptic cleft for longer periods of time. And so these SSRIs block the serotonin and keep them in the synaptic cleft and thus would increase or change our mood. Now the side effects of antidepressants uh, can be, um, what I wanna say, sometimes bad. So sometimes people uh, lose uh, the ability to feel anything. So sometimes people have antidepressants and a person, their family dies and they feel nothing or they don't get really excited about things. Uh, so that kind of has this flat affect effect on them. Um, uh, another one is decreased sexual drive. Uh, there's others like um, dry mouth, uh, weight gain is anti, um, antidepressants can have bad side effects on things like that. Okay, here's a up close, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped neurogenesis. Neurogenesis is the, the gener, uh, generative, or gener, almost, it generates new brain cells. Sorry, I tried to say genesis there. So it generates new brain cells. So one thing that they think these antidepressants may do is allow neurogenesis to occur, which is building new brain cells because it allows these to, uh, to work a little bit longer and give them time to repair and build new. Okay, so here's another, uh, I want to say up close picture of that. So here's my sending neuron and here's my receptors on the other side. So here's my terminal button and here's my synaptic cleft. And on the other side, I have those dendritic trees, right? So what happens is it's, it's spit out all that serotonin. And what happens on both sides is that it's reuptake. Now those serotonins like, like I'm sorry, SSRIs like Prozac and Paxil block it by uh, and keep it in the synaptic cleft for longer.
okay? Next, let's talk about some mood stabilizing medicine. We'll type that in real quick. So our mood stabilizing medications, there's really just two, uh, the lithium and the dipakoti. Uh, those are pretty simple medications. They're pretty cheap, like lithium salts. These are meant to stabilize mood. So people that have mood swings, like bipolar, like going from manic to depressive pretty quickly, um, that take lithium, they tend to stabilize over over the years, meaning that they don't have those, those switches from high to low anymore. So lithium is probably the most common, and that's really just our mood stabilizing medication. It keeps us pretty normal. Now let's move on to off of our drug therapies onto our physical alterations, the brain stimulation. So again, we already mentioned this early, but the electroconvulsive therapy, this is considered a procedure, right? So it's when there's, there's mild electrical stimulation that's given throughout the body, and you guys saw this in the movie. Uh, these are used with pretty extreme situations, so severe depression, meaning that there is a, very, a huge lack of serotonin to the point where they want to stimulate the brain into making more. It's, tr it's meant to hyper-excite cells uh, to produce more, kind of reset the brain. So it's set up in a lot of different places in the body. Um, there's shots that have to be administered so that you don't get electrocuted from it. Uh, there has to be a lot of monitoring during it. It was used more excessively back in history as more of a trying to reset the brain. And now that we've know better than that. Uh, we use it more just to try and stimulate the brain. Um, and the problem side effects from it, so you can imagine the problem side effects of being electric. And the biggest effect or problem or side effect that they noticed in most patients was memory loss. Not necessarily pain um, or, or brain damage, but memory loss associated with the simulation of the body and the brain. Now the other one that we talked about at the beginning, so an alternative to electroconvulsive therapy or electroshock therapy, here's just a, a more in-depth picture, is our magnetic stimulation. So magnetic stimulation is different in that it only, there's no, the patient's awake, first of all, and here's a picture of it over here. Uh, but it's, it's meant to, again, it's, think of magnets going from alternating back and forth, magnetic coil, meant to stimulate brain at only, the, some drawbacks of it, it only gets on the surface of the brain, but the patient is awake, there's no memory loss, there's no pain, it's not a procedure, uh, and there have been some results that show that this does just as well as um, electrosol, electric shock therapy, or electroconvulsive, or Similarly with that deep brain stimulation. Now deep brain stimulation is a little like electrical shock or magnetic stimulation except that there's a, an electrode that's put deep into the brain, so deep brain stimulation, and it just sends out localized magnetic or electricity that again simulates or stimulates that part of the brain in particular. So with anxiety and depressions, you can just target the parts of the brain that you want to activate it. There's been some new research that's looking for um, repetitive, the, the magnetic stimulations uh, mm -hmm. to hopefully get deeper into the brain, um, and that's something that's, that's in the works right now, Future Scientist of America. So here is your, uh, another picture of that too. So patient leans against this, the wire coils, and it doesn't go that far, but it activates these neurons within the magnetic field. Okay, now last one we're gonna look at, the psychosurgery, the lobotomies, the fun stuff to talk about. But because the lecture is so long already, we're gonna save lobotomies for class. So in class we'll look at lobotomies, uh, the most dramatic of the, the therapies or treatments for psychotic disorders, the history, the procedure, the side effects, and what we use it for today versus what it was used before in the past. Uh, long lecture, sorry guys, uh, but I will see you guys tomorrow, bye.